Hello there, welcome back to a new episode of Book and Spade. One of the elements that has become most controversial and interesting has been a lot of discussion within the Roman Catholic world about the recent consecration of Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of the Virgin Mary by Pope Francis on March the 25th, 2022. Now, for the larger world listening and watching this podcast, some references should be made. In 1917, three shepherd children and Fatima Portugal made the extraordinary claim to have seen the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. And one of the messages that was given to them was that Russia should be consecrated to her heart in order to avoid the errors of Russia being spread. On March the 25th, 1984, many decades after the event, John Paul II, then Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, consecrated the entire world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so questions were raised right off the bat whether this was a valid consecration in Catholic terminology or not. So much so that one of the best friends of Padre Pio, the chief exorcist of Rome, Father Gabriela Amorth, claimed that John Paul wanted to do this exactly as specified, but was persuaded by politicians not to. However, letters that have been attributed to Lucia, one of the surviving witnesses of the 1917 revelations, claim that it was validly done. However, in light of Russia's uh, incursion, invasion into Ukraine and the violence that has been witnessed around the world, the bishops of Ukraine sent word to Pope Francis requesting the consecration of Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This was recently done. Now, one of the elements that is most fascinating about this event is Um, All the bishops of the world were invited to participate in it. The original request was for the Pope to do this in all of the bishops of the world in union with him or ordering this event. Another fascinating element as well is that he also consecrated all of humanity as well. Now, if you are a Protestant uh, watching this video, or if you are a Greek Orthodox, I think that this discussion is equally valid. Because what is being presented in these events that have taken place is a fascinating theological discussion of the role of Mary in the life of the Christian. Nothing is more controversial than the role of this one woman in the history of the world. One could argue that not only between in the West, the discussion is often between uh, not Protestantism, but Protestantisms. Uh, and the many different perspectives that are viewed of soteriology of salvation and Roman Catholicism over Mary, but also, too, between East and West. Um, Even the term immaculate heart, for example, um, can easily be misunderstood in terms of its intent. So I thought I would offer some reflections and then give my comments about the validity or invalidity of the event. If you visit the Cloister Museum, that is in New York City. It's one of the most beautiful, eminent museums of medieval art. One of the images that will arise again and again is the image of the Madonna and child, the mother cradling the infant God. Now, if you've seen the beginning of the Da Vinci Code, you will know that Robert Langdon, uh, the character played by Tom Hanks, uh, shows an image of a mother and child and says, who is this? And I think someone in the crowd shouts out, it's Mary and Jesus. But of course, it's an image of Isis cradling uh, whatever the pagan deity was in the the Egyptian pantheon. And this is true, that the image of the mother and child is found across world cultural themes and motifs. It's one of our most age-old images given to all of humanity. A sign of the family, a sign of maternity, a sign that life continues. And in this culture and day and age where there is a lot of discussion about How does one negotiate the family in light of uh, controversies and and those who do not fit in uh, the supposed nuclear mold? What's unique is this image of the mother and child 
uh, was rather uncontroversial um, in the history of the world. It, it was seen as an image by which the world could rally together around the gift and miracle of life. And yet, what we see in Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, Norse mythology, you name it, is this hunger, however, for the coming of a child, the coming of a figure who will bring order into the world. This idea of the coming of a savior obviously is uniquely demonstrated in an inspired way through the Old Testament scripture. Um, in fact, in Genesis chapter 3, there's even the beautiful prophecy that though the serpent will wage war on the children of the woman, um, her seed will crush the serpent's head. And what's amazing about that idea is this meditation again and again within the minds of the Old Testament authors that one would come who would be the figure who would usher in the eschaton, the healing of the world. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says all of creation is groaning until the day when the consummation of the world will take place. Isaiah speaks in his prophecies of a time when death will be dissolved and a great feast will take place. And this is paramount because what's unique in the ancient world is despite this hunger, this transcendent hunger for the coming of the Savior, the images of the gods who negatively uh, deal with humanity, to put it moderately, uh, was often a very violent incursion. Uh, you, you think of the way women are treated as less than property in the light of the ancient cultural Near East. We, we think of the way in which we all know uh, the images of the figure who we know as the Gorgon, right? This, this, this female figure whose hair is serpents. The reason why she is ultimately cursed by Athena is because of a, a terrible interaction she has with Poseidon in the old uh, mythological world. So there's a sense in which people and their value is contingent on how they can be used and how they can use other people. But in comes the Old Testament. In comes this uniquely Jewish voice that says all men and women are not slaves to the gods, as in the Babylonian Anuma Elish, for example, where humanity consists as simply tools to be used by the deities. But instead, all men and women are made in the image and likeness of God. The, the Latin word dignitas comes to mind. They have transcendent dignity, whereas our declaration says in America are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. That is a Jewish idea, but it's meant to express all of humanity as well. And so the image of the mother and child in the Jewish mind particularly is not only the miracle of life, but the fact that God's imageness is present particularly in man and woman. And then of course we have G.K. Chesterton and his wonderful book, The Everlasting Man, that said because of this, man and woman tried to seek the ideal, the transcendent and ideal in the image of their great heroes, their mythological uh, figments of the past. And that these wonderful truths all culminate in God actually through a particular woman entering into time, entering into history. If Eve and Adam are the vehicles through which death enters the world, and by death we don't just mean biological death, we mean entropy, we mean disease, we mean the curse of pride that comes over all of humanity. It is now in Luke chapter 1, when a teenage girl on the far edges of the Roman Empire named Miriam is praying. It is in her invitation by the angel Gabriel that suddenly God can become man and life himself takes on a human face. Divinity finally becomes enfleshed. To quote Carl Jung, the archetype becomes real. And it is not a yes that is forced from her, as in the Greek mythology with, unfortunately, the mistreatment of the Gorgon uh, by becoming a monster as a result of her, her negative encounters with Athena and, and Poseidon, for example. It's not the story of 
uh, the Holy Ghost interacting um, in an aggressive way towards Mary. Instead, Mary is invited by God. Would you please become the mother of the creator of the universe? This shows the power of choice, the power of our invitation to cooperate with divinity. Yes, it's by grace that we are led to receive that invitation, but God wants a loving relationship with us, and that requires the free will ability to say yes. And so, in Luke chapter 1, Mary's fiat, Mary's yes, allows God to take up residence in humanity in a unique way. And so we see in the face of Jesus, through the blood of Mary, through the flesh of Mary, the gift of the word tabernacling among us. And whether you are a Protestant, a Greek, Russian, Ukrainian Orthodox, Roman Catholic, that much is transcendently shared. It is the miracle of the tabernacle, the miracle of the word finally taking his residence among us. And so it is that particularly in medieval art, this image of the mother and child would become president. And this gives rise to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' speculation and the medieval scholastic speculation that what drove Lucifer mad, what caused him to fall from grace, was not merely pride of wanting to be like God, as we read in Isaiah 14, but that he would see that God through Mary, would take on a human nature that is lower than that of an angelic nature. And that Lucifer could not bow to a God who would take on a human form. And this idea, whether it's you know, valid or not given your theological understanding, that, that wonderful medieval synthesis of the Church Fathers as well, allows us to witness the call to imitate Mary's discipleship. It is a discipleship. Her queenly approach is not in wearing a, a golden crown or bearing a scepter. It is willing to become a refugee from your country. It is a willingness to be scorned and hated, to be misunderstood, even to risk stoning, so that we can follow God and become the living temple for him to dwell in or as Paul reminds us, is the body of Christ. And so, what we have, I believe, quite movingly, taking place in the last couple of months within Roman Catholicism, is a remembrance of that cooperation Mary has played in the role of God becoming man. And that's why there was an emphasis on her heart, on her love, because ultimately it is in our self-sacrificial love that we imitate Jesus most richly. We see there are three theological gifts, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these ultimately is love. Now, the question is, what about language about consecration around the Immaculate Heart of this particular woman in salvation history? Uh, naturally, there'll be fears uh, within more of uh, the, the, the Protestant camp of idolatry, and, and there is a lot to be said for those concerns, given the fact that we can overemphasize one theological point to the neglect of the whole portrait, and that's a very, very strong concern. However, I believe when this is explained fully, I think it's an invitation for dialogue among all the branches of Christianity to come together and recognize that in a time of violence, in a time when a, a leader of the world, such as Vladimir Putin, is engaging in a violent way against his neighbors, that we do not conquer the world by means of sword and spear. We do not conquer necessarily by means of diplomacy alone, or through intelligence or through might, but like Mary to willingly fall on our knees and say, yes, I am willing even to accompany you, Lord, to the cross. I am willing, in fact, to watch my own heart suffer on that cross. I am willing even to go to the very depths of Golgotha, the place of the skull. Paul, I think, puts it best when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
and the life that I now live, I live to the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. One final note. Those who are suggesting that, that consecration was invalid, obviously that would be a sphere of discussion mostly of interest to Roman Catholics. Um, those who are calling it into question do so largely on the basis that supposedly Lucia was asked to tell the Pope to order all the bishops of the world to consecrate the Immaculate Heart of uh, Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The reality actually stands that if you have an invitation, as Pope Francis did, if you have an invitation from any great leader, no matter who that leader is, whether you think their authority should be questioned or not, you're not going to decline that invitation. I think the invitation of Pope Francis to all the bishops of the world does, in my theological opinion, amount to an order. And so I agree with uh, Bishop Athanasius Snyder that the event was valid, and I do look forward to seeing what may come to pass. But more than interdenominational strife, I hope it becomes an occasion for us to rediscover Mary and all of our faith's traditions. Perhaps we have overemphasized the differences more than our similarities. Perhaps we have become too fixated on categories of distinction from the 16th century rather than focusing on where the body of Christ stands in the 21st century. We must be called to unity now more than ever before. And in my work and in my passion with the ELCA, as with, of course, my deep and abiding love of my heritage, uh, rooted in the rock of Peter in the West, I have come to realize that where that authentic charity exists between brother and sister, there also abides the presence of the living God. I hope that you have found this discussion of interest, and I look forward to hearing from all of you soon. God bless you.